Vision. Welcome to the D-List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. A DeLorean. <laughs> you know what's even stupider than that joke? Some of the nitpicks people make about Back to the Future. Look, I'm not going to claim the movies are flawless. I might think it really loudly, but I acknowledge that everything made by humans has human error. But over the years, I've seen lots of people complain about certain plot holes in the trilogy that just aren't plot holes at all. Like, all you have to do is think about them for two seconds and you realize, oh, that actually does make sense in the movies. I don't know if it's the convoluted nature of the films that makes people want to poke holes in them, but lots of people keep trying to dig up dirt that doesn't exist. And I'm not saying there are necessarily zero plot holes in the movie, I'm just saying a lot of the ones that people bring up frequently are not plot holes. Some of these nitpicks are explained away in the movies themselves, some of them just through common sense, so here are some of the actual complaints I've heard over the years that I really don't think are worth complaining about. Number 7. How are Marty and Jennifer in the future? The so-called problem with the film. If Doc takes Marty and Jennifer out of 1985 to show them 2015, shouldn't their older selves not already be in 2015? George and Lorraine and Biff weren't taken out of the time stream, they stayed in 1985 and had the chance to live over the next 30 years, but Marty and Jennifer were plucked out, so what gives? The answer is never actually explained in the movie itself, but the canonical answer given by the creators is consistent with the way time travel works throughout the trilogy. You see, the future hasn't been written yet. So it stands to reason that there are an infinite number of possible futures. And when someone from Back to the Future sees the future, what they are seeing is the most likely future from that point in time. We know that this photograph represents what will happen if the events of today continue to run their course into tomorrow. So when the photos start to fade, it doesn't mean that there's an entire timeline where Dave McFly is born without a head. It means that the ripple effect hasn't caught up to the future yet, so now we're caught between seeing the timeline where Dave is born and the timeline where he isn't, because at this point, both of them are likely timelines. And when Marty and Jennifer see 2015, they're seeing the most likely 2015 at that time. And at that time, the most likely scenario is Doc and Marty complete their mission, they all go back to 1985, Jennifer thinks it's all a dream and forgets about it, and they all get to grow all together towards 2015. Of course, this future is at risk if, say, Jennifer gets abducted by the police and faints and Doc is unable to retrieve her. Number 6. George's first novel. The so-called problem. How is George only publishing his first novel in 1985 if he was already an established local author when he was killed in 1973? Well, the movie doesn't give an answer, but I would venture a guess that, like most sci-fi writers, he wrote a lot of short stories before he wrote his first novel. Probably published in local publications, which is why he was a Hill Valley local celebrity, but not really a famous author yet. Okay, it may not be the most impressive answer, but it also wasn't a very impressive question. You can do better than that. Number 5. Nobody calls me chicken needles. Nobody! The so-called problem. Starting in the second movie, Marty really hates being called chicken. This never comes up in the first movie. What the hell? Okay, so even granting this question validity, it's not really a plot hole. At worst, it's a retcon. Most practically, it's something that just didn't come up in the first film. Now, some people have theorized that the chicken reaction is a character trait of the Marty who grew up with a happy family, and not the Marty from the timeline that we followed in the first film. Back to the Future never tells us if, when you change timelines, your memories eventually get replaced via ripple effect with the memories of the you from that timeline, so... Let's assume that doesn't happen. Let's assume we are following the same Marty from the first movie, and if anyone had called him a chicken, he would have reacted similarly. Does it fit in with the Marty we know? We see Marty bewildered a lot in the first film, but we don't really see him scared all that much. But one thing that does seem to scare him is the possibility of being rejected in the pursuit of his dream. And when he catches himself showing fear, he immediately tries to put a stop to it. What if they say, get out of here, kid? You got no future. I mean, I just don't think I could take that kind of rejection. Jesus, I'm starting to sound like my old man. And there it is. Marty grew up in the original timeline watching his dad cower under Biff, watching his dad do anything Biff asked of him because he was scared. And Marty didn't want to be seen as scared because Marty's biggest fear was growing up to become his father. 
a fear that it turns out might have been somewhat justified. So if someone were to imply that Marty's a coward, it makes total sense that he'd be offended by that. And we know for a fact he has a confrontational streak, so he'd be unlikely to let an offense go. The actual nobody calls me chicken catchphrase may not have been conceived till the second movie, but the trait is completely in character for a sensitive yet aggressive little punk like Marty McFly. Number 4. Why doesn't Doc invent a fuel source? The so-called problem. Doc and Marty are stuck in 1885 because the DeLorean's out of gas and they can't get it up to 88, so they try all sorts of wacky hijinks to get it up to speed. But Doc is capable of inventing a refrigerator in the Old West, why can't he invent some wacky way to get it up to 88? The answer. I've seen numerous people ask this question, despite the fact that the movie repeatedly drives home why this isn't an option. A month! Doc, you're gonna get shot on Monday! No, I know, I know! Winter! Doc, what are you talking about? Monday, it's three days away! Even if Doc is capable of inventing a fuel source, he does not have time to do so. And the one alternate fuel source they did try literally backfired in the worst possible way. A trickier question is why they didn't siphon the gas out of the other DeLorean that he boarded up for Marty and 55 Doc to find. The movie doesn't actually give an answer to that, but it's plausible that in the nine months since arriving in 18 with no time circuits and no flying circuits, he used the gas for some other purpose. Or maybe he just didn't think they could dig it out of the mine, siphon the gas, and then repack it back into the mine in time before Buford found him. Or maybe he just didn't think of it until after he already broke the engine. I don't know, there are possible answers to that question, but it's not a stupid question, so it doesn't make this list. Number 3. Why isn't Dave named Marty? The so-called problem. After Marty leaves George and Lorraine in the 50s, she comments on what a nice name Marty is. So why didn't she use it for her firstborn son? The answer? Because Marty McFly is not named after Calvin Klein. Marty McFly is named after a different Martin McFly. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you have a brother named Martin McFly? I don't, brother. Maybe right after the camera cuts, George mentions that he had a great-great-uncle named Martin who lived in the Old West. Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe the person they named Dave after is just someone they met later, or someone who is still more important in their life than any Martins they knew. Just because they like the name Marty doesn't mean it's their first choice for a child's name. Number 2. How did old Biff get back to 2015? The so-called problem. When Biff goes back to 1955 to give his younger self the almanac, how does he get back to the same 2015 that he left? Shouldn't he go back to the 2015 from after he ruined Hill Valley? Doesn't Doc explain why they can't go back to that 2015? We travel into the future from this point in time. It will be the future of this reality. The answer. Is this really that confusing to anyone? Because it's really pretty simple. The ripple effect just hadn't yet caught up to 2015 when Biff left 1955. That's right, buddy! It's the ripple effect! In Back to the Future, even though traveling through time is instantaneous, it takes time for changes in the time stream to take effect. And you may think that's stupid, that time takes... time, but it's how the rules have always worked in this trilogy. It's the entire driving force of the first movie. Marty doesn't disappear immediately, the McFly kids slowly fade out over time because it takes a while for the ripple effect to catch up to them and change the future for certain. Ryan North described this as meta time in his excellent riff review blog on the Back to the Future novelization, and while the actual amount of time it takes for changes in the time stream to take effect is a bit unpredictable, Ryan might have actually figured out the mathematical formula for it, which is really damn impressive. I aspire to be that nerdy. But the point is, Biff traveled from 1955 to 2015 instantaneously, while it took a little longer for the ripple effect to travel to 60 years. And by the time Doc and Marty figured out what was going on, the ripple effect had already passed them and it would have been too late for them to go to 2015. Maybe it's not how time travel would work in real life, but it's how time travel works in the first movie, so if you accepted that, you can accept this. And the number one stupidest nitpick about Back to the Future, why don't George and Lorraine recognize Marty? The so-called problem. Why don't George and Lorraine notice how much their son looks like Calvin Klein? Doesn't George find it suspicious that his so-called son looks a lot like his wife's high school boyfriend? <sighs> this one is just so stupid that it almost infuriates me that I still see people bringing it up. I mean, just think about it. George and Lorraine knew Calvin Klein for one week. One week 30 years ago. 
and they don't have any pictures of him. You expect them to remember exactly what he looks like? There were kids I went to school with from third grade all the way to senior year of high school who I couldn't pick out of a lineup today. Oh, but Calvin Klein was such an important part of their life. Yeah, there were people in school who I considered my best friend for over a year who I keep forgetting about today. I might just be a terrible person, but still. Sure, Calvin introduced them, but it's not like a close personal friend introducing you to your significant other and then remaining in your life. It's more like the failed blind date you were on before you ran into the love of your life at a bar. Well, Marty, I want to thank you for all your good advice. I'll never forget it. But I'll proudly forget you. I mean, yeah, you were crucial in bringing us together, but now that we are together, we're too distracted by each other to remember details like which random weirdo stranger initiated this. Also, your music sucks. But let's just suppose that they do remember what Calvin looks like. They remember the contextless face of 17-year-old Marty McFly that they met 30 years ago. But when they look at Marty in 1985, they're not seeing the contextless face of 17-year-old Marty McFly. They're seeing their son. They're seeing every memory of him as a baby, him as a toddler, him as a five-year-old. Him growing into the 17-year-old son they have today. Most people don't see the faces of their loved ones in an objective, contextless void. They see the faces of their loved ones. And for most of us, context affects recognition just as much as actual resemblance does. It's why you can walk by a famous person without even noticing them, but you recognize them when you see them on your TV. Maybe they noticed at some point that he kind of resembled the guy they hadn't seen in 30 years, but it's a much bigger stretch to assume that they would recognize him as identical than that they would never make the connection. I mean, for crying out loud! Why am I getting so defensive over this? None of these things matter. Even if there was validity to these questions, they don't ruin the movies. I mean, details like this aren't what make a movie good or bad, what make a movie enjoyable or unenjoyable. If someone's using these points as excuses for not liking the films, it's because they already didn't like them for other reasons, maybe reasons that they couldn't put their finger on, and they're just grasping at whatever they can. And if you don't like Back to the Future, hey, more power to you. I still love it, and I suspect I will for all time. This video is not going to change anyone's mind if they don't trust the trilogy. It's just an excuse for me to talk about something I love that I've spent way too many hours thinking about. So, whether you agree with me or not that these points in the movies actually do make sense, all I can say is have a happy future. I'm going to go catch a matinee of Jaws 19. So until next time, this is Dave signing off.